Senator Rich Greenfield. I'm joined by uh, our four uh, distinguished panelists. We've got to my left, and we'll go down in order, Chris Orr Van Abima, who is Associate Director of Video at Bell Media, Alexander Kish, who is EVP of Business Development and Affairs at Vivo, John Klein to his left, founder and CEO of TAP TV, and Sterling Profer, who is Head of Digital for Vice Media. So we've got a, a whole group that's kind of all focused around how video is evolving. I, I thought a great way to kick it off, and I'd love to get each person's opinion um, as we look at, you know, we've got today Verizon's out buying AOL. We've got tremendous changes in the video marketplace. Uh, Disney suing Verizon over rebundling. We've got Sling TV. Charlie Ergen was talking about how consumers love uh, how they've seen a surprising adoption so far of Sling TV. There's clearly big changes going on in video, but I thought as a great starting point to get each panelist's opinion, what do you think the consumer actually wants? Like what is the cons does the consumer want smaller bundles, different bundles, no bundle? If you're sitting there as a consumer, and maybe, um, Chris, you start off with maybe the Canadian perspective and then we'll move sure. into the, the more of a U.S. perspective, but what do you think consumers want? So I think um, be, uh, beyond anything else, can consumers want choice, right? You want, you want the, the content that you're most interested in on the screens that you want for a reasonable price. And uh, in some cases, you know, that price is a subscription fee of some kind, whether it's bundled or, or not or bought over the top. And sometimes the price you pay is how much advertising you're willing to, to sit through to, to consume that content. I think easy access to content uh, you know, get 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 out of the way wherever possible, and uh, keep it keep it uh, easy easy to use. Uh, choice con content is king, and from a from a customer point of view, choice is king. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think I think the customer wants it all. Uh, I think they want it. Do they want to pay for it? I mean, Vivo is a free service. I, I think there's a willingness to pay, but I think there's there's a, a reluctance to pay too much, especially with younger millennial audience who are accustomed to getting more for less or getting more for free. Um, but I think, especially as we we move to a world where there's already, um, you know, beyond networks, you've got networks, cable networks, uh, the Netflix of the world creating original content that. Um, you know, I think it, 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 in the same way that, you know, movie fans don't flock to the movies to watch uh, a Universal Pictures release, they, they just want to see what they want to see, uh, I think we're going to move more and more to a place where, you know, users know what they want. You know, they know they want to watch Orange is the New Black, they know they want to watch Mad Men, but I think they're going to be less and less interested and less and less patient to worry about you know, am I getting AMC, am I getting Netflix, am I getting Amazon? It, it's about, you know, watching what they want, when they want, cheap, easy, fast. And I think they will become increasingly more demanding. John, how do you think that yeah, fits in? I, I think they want mind reading. You know, I think they want their devices just to know what it is they want the most. They don't want to be shoved into some predetermined bundle that works for some guy, you know, in Bethpage uh, making the bundle for them. They just want it to happen. They want it to be like a, a great boyfriend or... Hopefully Jimmy a, Dolan's watching. Great, you know, a great uh, husband or, or girlfriend who just understands what it is that they want because they do understand that the technology now can deliver that on, on anything. I mean, I'm wearing an Apple Watch. I can get, you know, at least notifications for now, but I where this is, you. where that, yes, where this is, I, I'm not sure I could talk to you here, but um, so, so I, I, and they also, I would say they want the new and the fresh. They want to be surprised. And that's always been the case in traditional media. But, you know, you look at Twitch, you look at Vice, you look at the way that they jump on things, on content approaches that, dazzle them because they had never existed before and yet they become a total bullseye. That's what I think they want. Sterling, your audience is you know, squarely on the millennials. H how do you think that audience thinks about video today? What do they want? I think everything that everyone said I agree with, just to piggyback on what John said, I mean, they, they would, when the capability to understand them exists, then if you don't, you're actually at a disadvantage. And 
you can understand them through technology and you can understand them by just knowing who they are and just actually, you know, I mean, th th there's actually a, a, a way to, you know, build experiences that are great for users deductively or inductively through sort of personalization and algorithms and data and all these things. But there's another way to build audiences, which is proactively by having a really well-defined brand and being able to sort of, you know, reinforce that with every single piece of content that you put through. I think in a lot of ways what users want is simplicity, and that simplicity can come in a number of different ways, but it, it's either through the service or it's through the brand, right? Because at the end of the day, all of us are going to be reduced to apps. And we're either going to have our own apps or we're going to be piggybacking through someone else's app. And whether that's a web app or a native app on your phone or, what, or, or something on your watch, I mean, at the end of the day, if there's not a compelling reason for the user to dive into that world, then why would they? Well, but you asked, that brings up an interesting topic of this idea of we're moving from a world where people watch channels to they just watch shows. And so in a world where you just watch shows, how do, I mean, most channels, you know, let's take an AMC for a second. They have a hit show on the air one hour a week, usually, you know, I don't know, probably 30 to 40 weeks a year, one day each week, they have a hit show on the air. How are you going to engage people all the time? Like, each of you, your challenge is how do you keep consumers using your experiences? Yeah, and, and, and we think that it's even going to go beyond watching one show on one network. Our, our company, TAP, is built around watching one person. You know, we build networks around individuals. Um, and when that happens... Why don't you give them an example so they can uh, have the context? We run the Sarah Palin channel. Uh, and the biggest supporters of Sarah Palin who uh, want to feast on everything she has to say about everything and who want to see glimpses of her life behind the scenes um, can go there and just immerse themselves in her world. And they pay $10 a month to do that. And that's more than Netflix costs per month. And that's because although Netflix has all that, they don't have this, right? Her channel is the only place where you can get more of her than you could have ever dreamed. And we've just launched our fourth channel. Uh, this is around Christian rockers. We're about to launch channels five through eight over the summer, uh, each built around an, an individual that taps into a community. Um, when you're doing that, when you're tapping into a community, be it a community of music lovers or a community of, of, of millennial news aficionados, then it's easier to be top of mind for them. The marketing is the content itself, the product itself. Be you become a fixture in their life rather than uh, a product that they've bought and they have to remember to use. So the comments that we get from, from our subscribers are, I cannot wait to get home and lie back and fire up my Roku and, and watch your channel, and, or my channel is, is how they think of it. I was at the upfronts earlier this week and seeing medical procedural after medical procedural, thinking, you know, it, it's really hard to get mind share in today's landscape. You've got so much content. You know, when you think about original content and the need to create a, a brand, you know, how do you do it in this world? How do you stand out? Because obviously you need people to go, whether it's to a tap app, to Vice, or whether it's even to drive people to Vice on HBO, or whether you're creating content for Crave. You've got to create stuff that differentiates you from everybody else. How do you, how do you all do that? What, what is the most important thing that people should be thinking about in terms of creating original, or creating original content or unique content? Um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll speak to that one, I guess. So. The, we, we very recently launched uh, an SVOD uh, service sold through, um, not, not quite direct to consumer, uh, sold through uh, our distribution uh, partners. And uh, we have, you know, slated, not, not, not yet uh, launched, but original programming for that, for that service. And I think what you're actually, you're gonna see a blend of original content that speaks to your your brand with you know your 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 voice and and serves the demographic that's interfacing with your uh, with your with your service and you're also going to have um, the big studios that make loads of fantastic content that's 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 in demand your content uh, being an original content creator and owner is going to become more and more important but I think you're always going to have a mix of 
licensed hits that everybody wants to have available, <coughs> as well as you know the the unique content that uh, you can you can use as a differentiator. I guess that plays some way into Vivo's model of you have a lot of content from other people called you know musicians who create lots of content every day for you and you license or syndicate out, but you also are creating your own programming now. Yeah, and I, I think for us it's it's maybe the. The calculus is a little different because of that, and, and in a way we, we can shortcut the process and sort of draft off the artist as brand. So for us, it's on the one hand, a big priority is trying to build the Vivo brand as you know a meaningful standalone brand that has its own voice. But we're doing that side by side with the Katy Perry brand and the Rihanna brand and the, you know the Jay-Z brand. So for us, I mean, some of our program we're able to build in a way a shoulder programming that lives you know either in in some form as a teaser or as a follow-on to a big video premiere so if we do uh you know a follow piece about an artist a behind the scenes some kind of lifestyle piece you know we can we can kind of draft off the the momentum and the interest um, of fans of those artists um, but at the same time we are also trying to kind of build create programming that that can stand on its own two feet at the same time. Um, so it, it's a bit of a mixture, but I think you know, we, can, we uh, have some advantage there that we can, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can draft off of that other strong brand and, and kind of understand our audience, and that, that's a jumping off point for us. And Sterling, if I put it into your context, HBO's got lots of old, older movies that they put up every day, but they came to you to create original new programming, why? I think that uh, I think that what you can see is that oh, there we go. Um, the Vice brand is a powerful brand, right? And if you think about everything that we do um, across all the various touch points that we have, um, the brand itself benefits from network effects. What I mean by that is the more content we put into the Vice brand the more powerful that brand becomes. And I think that what we've seen with HBO, which has been absolutely incredible, is that um, the, the weekly show that we've done with them has been an incredible success. I mean, both from an audience and from an award-winning standpoint. And, uh, you know, Plepler said it best when he said that uh, he, he's not in the news business, he's in the vice business. And that says a lot in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, power, the power of the partnership that we've built together and, you know, the, the value that HBO sees in that. I think what Vice does really well when you, when you talk about um, captivating or capturing the imagination of the audience is you've broken the mold in, in terms of how you tell a story about what's going on in the world. And you've done it fearlessly and consistently. And every story is different, but it, it speaks to an overall experience exactly. that one can expect when they go to Vice. But John, there's also an authenticity, right? Yeah. That, that you're after as well and what you're trying to do. Yeah, and you know where I learned about authenticity was when I was 20 years ago overseeing, I was executive in charge of 60 Minutes. And uh, that meant mostly I was approving their, their flights on the Concord. I really didn't have much need to be involved. Hopefully the audience knows what 60 Minutes still is. Editorial. They're still great. I, I think they've done an amazing job updating that show. But um, at the time, you know, you had the Mount Rushmore of journalists. You had Mike Wallace and Morley Safer and Ed Bradley and Don Hewitt, the genius who invented it. And I asked him, you know, well, so how do you decide what's in the show? He said, I don't decide, Don. He said, I don't decide. They decide. And they decide what stories they do. I never, he said, I never have assigned a single story on 60 Minutes because I have these guys. And these guys are doing the stories they care most about. And lo and behold, it's the most successful show in the history of television. Not just news show, single most watched show ever in the history of the medium. And so I've taken that away with me at, at TAP and said, all right, well, what, what do our stars of our channels most want to talk about, that's what their channels are about. And when you do that, you attract the super fans who care most about that person and that point of view, and that's what gets them to pay. And I think Vice does the same thing in their, in their way, L listening to or giving vent to the voices of uh, a, a multiple journalists who could not otherwise get on traditional uh, news programs. But do we have to rethink what it means to be successful? I mean. We live in a world where I, I traditionally think of, 
you get to 100 million subscribers or 80 million plus subscribers and you're a successful cable network. Glenn Beck has, I think, 400,000 subscribers. WWE has a million subscribers. Are we redefining what success is in the video business? Sure, because those, those two examples you use, I mean, Glenn is incredibly profitable at three, 400,000 subscribers. Imagine an ad-supported vehicle, you know, property uh, in the digital world could not make a dime off of 400,000 users. And a television show on cable that had 400,000 viewers would soon find itself a digital show. It would find itself canceled. So, it, you know, the, to, to have these different economics and the ability to generate tens of millions of dollars in profit off of that base d redefines everything. How does Crave fit into that or how you think about over the top video? Yeah, so um, we're not, so over the top is a, it's a unique opportunity for us, right? So in, in Canada, you've got um, number one, you've got more TV subscribers. We talked a little bit about the, the, this before. More, more, more households subscribe to TV than, than broadband. So for us, uh, when we were bringing Crave to market, uh, from a distribution point of view, it made more sense to go with the bigger base. Um, we, we pay a lot of attention to how consumers are watching and how they like to get their, get their content. Direct consumer is something that we, we, we talk about frequently. Um, no, no immediate plans um, for that, but it, uh, for us, we, we went with, we can get this to the most people, uh, leveraging our existing distribution, and it's been very successful uh, so far. Um, I think I answered your question. And how does that, I mean, <laughs> when you think about that versus Netflix in Canada, what, you know, how does Netflix compete with you? So, um, they don't, so we, we, have, uh, we have lots of original, we both have lots of original content. I think that you have a, a mix of folks who, you know, there's cord shavers or cord cutters, uh, but a lot of the time you have someone who has full cable package, adds Crave TV, and subscribes to Netflix. They're TV and movie lovers as opposed to the, the cord cutters. Netflix has a great product. They kept it simple, they keep the content you know, out, out front. Um, that doesn't mean they're necessarily uh, re replacing all of the content that people are already consuming. Should Vivo have a subscription offering? I mean, does it make sense to be a subscription business or can you live in an ad-only world, which is, and you've been there since the very beginning, it hasn't evolved yet into a subscription business, but should it, I guess, is the question. Or how do you think about the pluses and minuses of what John was even just talking about? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a question. It's something we, we wrestle with from time to time. Um, you know, I think, I guess it remains to be seen. Um, there are, you know, for us uh, to date, we've been able to be pretty successful with a pure ad-supported business. Um, and I think hand in hand with that, you know, you, you could sort of have a, a ubiquity as a goal at the end of the day. I think where um, should we transition or create a, uh, an SVOD, a paid service, I think you need to start looking at, um, you know, suddenly ubiquity may work against you, right? And, and, you know, exclusivity becomes more important and kind of picking and choosing where you go and what your on-ramps are. So today it's been about, um, you know, creating as, as much ubiquity, as many on-ramps, bringing the content as available as widely as possible through YouTube, through a host of other, uh, you know, partners and apps and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Beck's gotten onto TV, you know, at least on a couple of different distributors. Uh, we've seen Maker Studios get onto the Sling platform. It, does it make sense as we get what we like to call virtual MVPD? Should Vivo be a channel just like MTV is a channel? <laughs> I mean, is there any reason why Vivo shouldn't be, a, in a sense, a linear and on-demand channel in a virtual MVPD world? No, I think it makes total sense. I mean, I think we're, we already are to some degree. I mean, we have, uh, as part of our core service today, we've got what we call Vivo TV, which is uh, a set of linear channels that really functions as, you know, it's fully programmed one-to-many, um, which is, you know, accessible on Roku and Apple TV and Samsung and the like, and actually on, on Dish's own set of apps. Um, so I think there's, there's an easy transition, um, you know, to become a full set of channels that lives long, 
on demand as well. I think it's 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 not a big jump. It's it's a fairly nuanced transition. I think today. John, do you want a Sarah Palin channel on Sling? In yeah, that world. Sure, that that'd be great. Um, uh, it, all of these new packagers open up all kinds of new possibilities, and they come to us too, looking for original content that can be exclusive to their services. I'm not saying Sling specifically, but um, if if you're if you're introducing a new bundle or a, or a new distribution system to consumers, of course you want unique original content. Uh, that's what HBO did in, in turning to Vice, uh, and, and that's what's happening now. We ought to build a, a Vivo paid channel, and, and you know there could be the Rihanna channel, and there could be the Jay-Z channel, and um, what, what happens when you go from free ad-supported to paid subscription, your content offering gets more specific, therefore it does weed out, it becomes, you know, it, it disinvites a lot of folks, but in doing that, it really dazzles the people who decide to come in because you can really target your offering. And, and specificity is the friend of content companies in this world, and generalism is the enemy. There's a great Simpsons episode where um, I think Homer sits down in the movie theater and the ads come on before the movie, and uh, he yells out, um, I just paid to see the movie. I have to watch ads. What is this like Hulu? <laughs> and, you know, we, yet we live in a world where video subscription and advertising have co kind of always lived together. Do you think that in the new world of these kind of micro subscriptions or smaller subscriptions, should there be traditional advertising? Or, sh you know, where does advertising fit into this equation? We're, we're seeing some uh, phenomenal opportunities. We're creating some really uh, interesting uh, sponsorship opportunities within the subscription Meaning not world. not 30 second spots. No, I mean so much better and so much more we think appealing to end users. We haven't rolled them out yet but we're about to. But as you start to think about opportunities to translate passion for a person or a personality into passion for a product in an organic way, um, there are dozens of approaches that you can take that we don't think are going to be offensive to subscribers. And instead, we think it's actually going to uh, provide a service to them. And, and, and we're talking about not only messaging within the, the media experience, but real physical on the ground opportunities for sponsors to interact with subscribers to the channel. Because when you know your end user and your end user feels that you know them, well, then introducing a sponsor into the equation uh, becomes a lot easier because you can be very specific about the offering. Stuart, or go ahead, sorry. Yeah, um, so do you think that that's, um, is that double dipping at all? You're already getting them to pay uh, X uh, number of dollars per month for access, and then you're gonna layer in, don't worry, it's not really advertising, you're gonna like it, but it's still, it's still advertising. <laughs> Technology. Let's see, if that were just a series of ones and zeros, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can everybody hear me now? Double dipping, you were saying. Yeah, double dipping. So, so is it is it um, uh, po pose a question? I guess is it fair to charge the same price for Sarah Palin fans uh, that are going to view advertising or not view advertising? Um, People are, consumers are willing to pay. Uh, they're willing to pay for the content that they love. At what point are you gonna push it over the edge that that cost is now too high when they're paying with uh, enduring advertising and they're paying with you know, direct, direct out of their pocket? Yeah, I mean, I subscribe to The Economist, but I see ads throughout that and I'm not offended. So that, so that bridge has been crossed, but the question in our world is how intrusive are the ads that you do versus how useful are they? Uh, and do they even seem like an ad? I think that there are many ways to introduce sponsors into the subscription ecosystem without it ever feeling like an advertisement. Sterling, what's the best example of what Vice has done with a brand? If you were to pick one just great, you know, great example of what you've done. Wow. Um, there are so many I would, good ones. I would point to a recent example of a partnership that Vice News actually did with Skype. Um, we partnered with Skype to 
enable Vice News to tell stories that we wouldn't otherwise be able to tell and to introduce new formats that we otherwise wouldn't be able to create. And it is only through what they actually enable for us that we can accomplish that. And so when, when I was listening to this discussion, I was kind of thinking about what I think are essentially three thresholds that you have to think about when you're introducing any kind of barrier to content, right? Whether it's advertising or some subscription. I think that there is there is a value threshold, right? They need to think that the offering is valuable enough. I think that there is a patience threshold where people need to actually think that wading through whatever you know block there is, whether it's an authentication block or whether it's an ad block. Um, and then I think the third thing is, you know, hmm, I'm actually blanking on it. So it was, it was, uh, oh, it's it's trust. It's trust. I mean, as soon as you sort of lose the trust of your audience, they have endless numbers of alternatives, right? And so if you think about what John's saying, in terms of if the ad is actually additive to the user experience, then that's great. But as soon as you compromise trust, right, as soon as Sarah Palin compromises the trust on her channel, people are no longer going to see that same value there. So I just think that thinking through those three sort of thresholds and making sure that any kind of, uh, any kind of hindrance to consuming the content that you introduce, if it passes those three, I think you're in pretty good shape. Um, and I think that the audience is sophisticated enough to understand uh, and frankly, there's enough content that isn't great out there that people understand that you know, creating great content uh, doesn't you know, rain down from the sky. Just, the money has to come from somewhere. And I, and I think that's, that's true even in a purely ad supported experience, right? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's even more so where you've got that as a barrier to, in a paid experience, right? The, the threshold is higher, but I mean, you know, I think for, for Vivo, when we go about creating, call it brand name entertainment, and to my mind, it's, it's more of a spectrum, right? But it's, it's not necessarily you've got sort of brand name entertainment and pure editorial, but there's this whole range of uh, integrations, call them. And, you know, your audience can really sniff it out when it, when it feels like a cheap ad. Right, so even you know, so, what have you done that's really interesting? Like, give us an example of something that Vivo has been able to pull off that doesn't feel uh, forced, that where you actually maintain viewer trust. I mean, I think you know we have a long-running partnership with American Express around you know, uh, unstaged series of concerts where uh, we bring together uh, you know big-name movie directors with big acts and put them together. And American Express has been a partner with us for four years on that, and you know it, it's. Uh, while there's there's a media buy on it, and so you know you'll you'll see American Express ads running, but within the content itself, you know there's a certain amount of branding, there's a certain amount of messaging. There's, you know, Amex is able to offer this as a benefit to uh, to their members uh, through ticketing and early access, and they've been able to build up, you know, a brand association with the program. But, you know, it, it's. I'd say it's more along the lines of, you know, the JVC Jazz Festival, right, where the brand just becomes sort of synonymous with, with the content. So American Express unstaged, the unstaged brand has become an American Express brand, um, an expression of American Express. But, you know, I don't think it's something where, you know, that no one's holding up the, the Pepsi bottle. Um, when you think about... Um how we evolve in the cable universe or the cable set-top universe. We still live in a world where set-top boxes still dominate, kind of very old-school set-top boxes. How do you integrate all of this over-the-top content that's proliferating? Should it all be integrated into the set-top box? Or should it be, you know, we, right now we live in kind of this weird world where there's a cable experience or, you know, cable satellite experience, and then there's a separate HDMI port for what I would call everything else. Does that change? Should it change? Where, where do you think we are in that transition? Because there's a lot of OTT content that's exploding right now. Some of it's sitting on this panel. Sure. I think, um, I think there's still, there's still uh, users that uh, have patterns of consumption that we need to uh, ma maintain and, 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 and serve. 
there's a significant portion of the population I mentioned earlier, like more, more homes subscribe to TV in Canada than, than broadband. The set-top box, dominant in terms of you know, VOD, VOD consumption for any of the, the, the networks of programming that we make available. And for, for some of the other you know, over-the-top options, um, it's okay if you have to switch to you know, HDMI 2. Um, maybe at some point uh, you want to blend those worlds together so there's really just one place for, for it to go um, or for, for users to go to get, their, to get their content. But for right now, you're seeing uh, patterns of uh, consumption on the set-top box differ a little bit from uh, patterns of consumption when you're on a Chromecast or an Apple TV or, or through the other, uh, the other output on, input on your TV. But is there any reason why a Netflix shouldn't be an option on a, you know, on a Bell set-top box? Or, you know, is there any reason why they shouldn't all be part of the same experience so I can get to whether it's Sarah Palin channel, you know, whether or not, you know, basically should there be an open platform or should there be a closed platform, I guess is really the way of thinking about the world. Would that be better or worse as you look out? Well, so uh, being the media company that owns a healthy, uh, a healthy number of specialty channels, I'm, uh, I'll say that uh, we, we, we've invested in the networks that uh, distribute our content through the, through the set-top box and our distribution partners. And there needs to be a pretty compelling reason for us to open that up to, to others. Now, being a digital guy also, I'd say absolutely. Like, okay. I love watching Netflix. I love watching Crave TV. Uh, and I want both of those in, in the same spot. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a safe answer and say best of both. Do you think we're ever going to see Vivo on a Comcast at Top Box? I think it's highly possible. I mean, I think... You know, the answer to your question kind of comes back to your very first Without question. launching a cable network, that is. I mean, like, <laughs> obviously, if you launch a cable network, not like anyone on this panel is thinking about it, but if there were to, you know, without it being your existing OTT experience that you have today, do you envision operators like Comcast and Charter and others basically enabling you to be on their set-top boxes? I mean, we've heard, you know, rumblings uh, about Netflix Hulu's now going to be part of Cablevision set-top, but it still seems like very, very early days for this. Uh, personally, I mean, I, I think it's an in inevitability. I mean, I think going back to your very first question of what does the consumer want at the end of the day, and I think based on everyone's answers to that, I, I think that the consumer momentum will ultimately push uh, the industry towards a fully, you can on the one hand look at it as a fully integrated experience or a fully disaggregated experience. I think it's a little bit of both. But, you know, to, uh, to John's point, you know, the user, the user just wants what they want, right? They want someone to, to know what they want. And, you know, I think they will, as I said before, I think demand, ultimately, there are going to be enough ways and enough shortcuts um, to get what they want. And I think we'll see that momentum happen actually very quickly. I mean, I think if two years ago, I wouldn't have thought where we we are where we are today for another call three years. So I think- Referring to this kind of the, the fraying of the bundle? Yeah. Kind of where we are right now? Yeah, I mean, to my mind, that's, that's actually happened much more rapidly than I would have anticipated. So I think we're gonna be there a lot sooner than, than I would have thought. So I, if I, you're, I, I'm yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, uh, the question that I have is, so you have, you know, c cable and satellite television service providers, and they, they play that, aggregator role, right? They bring all the, all the content providers together. And now you're starting to see uh, a lot of, you know, niche or niche, as I have been corrected several times while, uh, while here. Um, Which one's correct? I always say niche. I'm going with niche. All right. I'm just, it's... But you speak you know. French, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Not well, but okay. Um, is it, is it the, the, the cable companies and the satellite uh, television service providers that need to play that aggregating role to include, you know, under, under the tent and maybe as alternatives, you can get Netflix or Hulu or, you know, uh, Taps or Vivo, as well as HBO and ESPN or Canada TSN. Uh, or is it is it their role? That's the that's the new role that they need to that they need to fill. Or is it Google or Apple that's going to be that big tent that everyone's going to go to to get everything in in one spot? Who's going to who's going to bundle the unbundled? 
uh, is, is the question that I had. And is bundling even necessary? I mean, apps may be up, upending the whole MVPD model because everybody's getting pretty good at going to open table when they want to make a lunch, lunch reservation or they'll go to Vivo, to that app, if that's what they want. And, you know, they're not very perplexed by it. So if you're an MVPD, you're sitting there, you're in the consumer business, why on earth would you not want to be in the business of providing your end users exactly what it is they want, whatever that happens to be? And if you don't, they may end up really not needing you that badly. Our first channel that we launched, uh, New Life TV, which is built around a Christian radio host who's got two million listeners and, and probably none of them are you. Uh, but they're spread all across the country and they worship this guy, Steve Arterburn. He's phenomenal. And the number one request that we got from all of his subscribers when we first launched, and these are people uh, primarily 45 to 60 years old who subscribe to the channel, number one request was Roku. They all wanted to be able to go home and watch this video that they're watching on their phone or their tablet during the day. They just knew intuitively that this is TV, yet it's not available on their cable box, so they want the Roku app. And they Many of them bought a Roku box for that purpose. Many of them already had Roku. Why, why do you want to be giving that business to Roku? The challenge is that out of the $70 that I pay my cable operator every month, and I'm sure many people pay way more than that, but if you just look at the, kind of the average video bill in the country, they spend roughly 35 to 40 of that on programming, and the rest is profit. The question is, in this OTT world, how much profit will there be to make? You know, I, I don't think Netflix is going to give a margin for selling. They'd love to be on this platform, but if there's no margin, they're happy to be on Roku where they don't share in economics with Roku. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge is the traditional ecosystem is makes this very substantial margin on reselling and basically repackaging yeah. to your point on bundling. Will there be a profit to package in a Vivo channel or are they just doing it for free to drive broadband? That's going to take a, a, a while for them to understand that they're just going to make less money in this new world. And that's going to be an interesting transition. Yeah, unless they make it up on usage. Which, you know, unclear in a net neutrality world how much they can charge for usage. Right. But w we've gone almost 40 minutes and we haven't brought up the word mobile. And I thought, you know, to have an OTT panel, it would be a disservice to not talk about mobile. So, Sterling, why don't you talk how much of vice occurs on mobile? Over 50%. Over 50%. And, and, and you know, on a... <clears throat> on a platform by platform basis, that number varies. Um, and also, I mean, you know, I think that we are moving to a point now where mobile has become dominant enough that we probably need some further classifications within what we consider mobile. What do you uh, mean by that? Well, just simply between tablet and uh, handset, essentially. Um, and then ultimately, you know, watch and then pretty soon car. So, I mean, we're going to need to get fairly, uh, fairly dynamic because ultimately what we're talking about is we're talking about different, different moments and different instances uh, for users. But more importantly, it's about <clears throat> find me the nearest, biggest screen, right? And a lot of times, you know, I mean, I was watching uh, last night, I was watching uh, the... Grizzlies versus the Warriors, right? And I was watching that on my phone because I was on my way home. As soon as I got home, I have cable, I turn on the TV, put on TNT, and there it was on my big screen. And But do you, you know, think that's true for the millennial generation where I feel like many of them actually <laughs> prefer the smaller device because it's more intimate and personal, whether you know, that be a laptop or a phone? It, it all, it, it depends on, you know, it, it, it gets very, <clears throat> It's all about creating the best experience on whatever screen is available. In some instances, you're gonna have more than one screen available. And then the question is, if you have a focal point around one piece of content, let's just call it one show, how can you create the best experience for those users, right? And if, if the sort of primary, let's just say you're in an instance where you're at home and you have a mobile phone and you have a TV at home. And regardless of whether you have cable or you don't have cable, if you have an opportunity to put that beautifully shot show onto a TV screen, I think if it's easy to do so, you will. And the question is, then what becomes the role of mobile and a mobile device, whether it's a tablet or a handset in that world, right? Because a mobile device in the home is still a mobile device. 
you're just in the home. And so um, building great experiences that translate across screens is most important. But building a content ecosystem where you can understand the nuances and the benefits and the power of individual screens gives you an opportunity to build a more robust, sort of richer content ecosystem, hopefully giving an opportunity to create more value for the audience. Um, you know, from our standpoint, we have our own Vice branded apps and Vice content is available through any number of third party apps. And so our role is to build the most compelling experience and ultimately the simplest, easiest to understand experience for the users because, you know, as, as was said earlier, the, the days of, uh, you know, the, the days of biz dev deals not having to be held accountable to the audience are kind of over, right? And so at the end of the day, the user can, uh, can call bullshit and they will and they are. And so it's just important for content owners and distributors alike to work together constructively to ensure that, you know, I like to say at least, that the audience has a seat at the negotiating table. Vivo follows me everywhere, I assume. What, how, how does Vivo look on a mobile basis? Well, I mean, like, like Vice, it's well, well over 50% of our usage is, is mobile. But again, if mobile, tablet, those definitions kind of uh, uh, meld together a bit. I mean, I think, you know, today the experience is, is largely the same. I think it's definitely something we are trying to be cognizant of. Um, you know, there are, on the one hand, on the big screen, I mean, we pride ourselves on the richness and high quality of, of the content, and it looks amazing on a big screen. But is that still a very small percentage of views, meaning the TV, whether it be Roku or TV apps, is that still a very small business today, although growing fast? It's, it's small, but growing really rapidly. I mean, and actually for us, it's interesting because off of YouTube, our own apps, it's actually the biggest part of our platform. Um, Sorry, just explain that. So if you leave the YouTube ecosystem, yep. The biggest place where the Vivo experience itself is being consumed is on the TV through a Roku or a smart TV app. That's right. And Got is it. that from total viewership or time spent? Uh, from, well, from, from time spent. So, yeah, I mean, a big part of that right. is, is engagement is, you know, nearly 10x what it is exactly. on mobile. Session and, time over the right. top can be... Right. And interestingly, session time on mobile Especially versus... Especially for videos, I would think. You just put them in a playlist yeah, and you exactly. keep going, right? But session time for mobile over desktop is actually about 3x, which you, right, it, it's, it's kind of counter. It's surprisingly long, though. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, the, the opportunity on mobile is, you know, what can you do to tap into the fact that it is mobile, that you may know where your person is or what they're doing, right? So not in a kind of big brother necessarily, like, serving them specific ads kind of way necessarily, but are there experiences, are there more interactive uh, experiences that lend themselves to the fact that you are mobile, that you're in one place or another. Well, I assume um, conceptually that's why AOL was just bought by Verizon today. Whether it makes sense is another story, but I assume that's the concept behind that transaction. Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> With a smile. Um, there are a hundred million people in this country, the U.S. specifically, who are spending $65, $70 a month for multi-channel television. I'm sure you could give in a second the numbers for Canada. Um, but I'd love to get, before we take questions from the audience, whether it's no longer subscribing to a bundle or taking a smaller bundle, where do you think that 100 million is in five years? I think it's totally up to the, to the distributors and the strategies that they pursue. It could be 100 five years from now, if, they're, if they'll embrace reality, um, and if they're stubborn, and if they try to parlay their position under the hoop, which is where they are right now, and ignore the people shooting three-pointers from out there, then it could be less than, it will be less than 100, no doubt. Sterling, any of you? I think that, uh, I think it really is going to be a function of the business strategy that they take, but I think it's also going to be a consequence of 
the sort of assets of each company because some and I can get HBO now with your great content on it directly to my phone for fifteen dollars a month and get all of your YouTube content on your apps or all that for nothing I mean that's a free business with advertising obviously but that's a lot cheaper than what I used to have to spend to get HBO where I had to spend sixty five dollars plus fifteen yeah and it all depends on you know the specifics of what the what the user really wants and what to a user constitutes a rich enough you know uh, content ecosystem for them and, and and just to what I was mentioning earlier I mean you gotta you gotta think that some of these distributors own the pipes in the ground some of them own wireless networks some of them own both some of them own content right um, and the landscape is getting increasingly complex. And if you think about, you know, AT&T and DirecTV, you think about Comcast and NBCU, you think about, you know, Verizon and AOL. I mean, it's getting very, very interesting. And it's very, very complicated. And I, I, I think, again, I think the role of the content owner is to really advocate for creating the best, most seamless, most easy to understand content ecosystem for their users. Um, and ultimately to just have a brand. Because if you have a brand, then it doesn't matter what touch point the audience is interacting with your brand. If they know what they're going to get, if it means something to them, then you can bring them in. And if you have to play in a world where you know there are subsets of your content that are either wholly exclusive or exclusive for a window. I mean, the windowing strategy between exclusivity, between, you know, AVOD, SVOD, authenticated TV viewing, I mean, it's, it's infinitely complex. Uh, I think that... And it just frustrates the consumer. It just frustrates the consumer. And I think that from a content owner standpoint, when you're thinking about the content availability and windowing strategy, you need to make sure that you are able to clearly articulate the value of what is available in which place to what user. And, um, you know, there is an existing paradigm, there are future paradigms, and I think that every single company out there that owns distribution is thinking long and hard about where they are now and where they plan to go. And there's a moment now where uh, I think that it's just, you know, we all need to really work constructively together to try and create the best ecosystem. Where are we in Canada? How many homes take multi-channel television today? So we, we have uh, 80 to 90 percent of Canadian households have, uh, have te tele paid television services and um, broadband follows behind that by about you know, 10, or, 10 or 15 percent. Um, we also have a more distributed population so high speed access is not the same in all parts of the or the country. I think, you know, if we take if we look at that, it are a hundred percent of the people that are paying uh somebody for uh cable TV uh today gonna be the same number in, in five years? Probably not, but I think you're still gonna have a hundred percent of the people that are paying for content, paying for content. Um, they may have different ways that they get it, the same way they do today. You're going to have a bit of a realignment for where people are looking or, or trying to get uh, the content that they want. Um, pay TV is, is evolving. It's not, um, you know, uh, exploding. Uh, I think that we're going to see uh, some interesting, some interesting mashups uh, on our journey to get to um, bundling the unbundled. Um, We'll see. 100% of the people that are paying for pay TV now are, are going to be still paying for it in five years. Just uh, they, may be, uh, they may be paying somebody different than they are now. And more people who aren't paying anything will be paying as well. Why don't we take some questions from the audience? So, Sterling, to get back to the audience, right, we were talking, you, you mentioned before, so it's interesting, you know, in the linear world, we press play, and if you guys started a channel, this is probably the focus on the Vivo and, and, and you guys. So if you think about your content, right, potentially going to a slim TV, how do you hold them accountable? The question is, is, if you deliver your audience on Vice, right, you know, you believe in that experience, that quality experience. Now, if you start distributing to Sling or whatever other services with a channel potentially in a bundle, how do you ensure that your content's gonna deliver the same way or have that same experience that you have on your apps? So let me just phrase the question just for the audience listening uh, on the webcast. So the question is, is as you see things like Vice move to platforms like Sling, 
uh, and other virtual MVPDs, how do you ensure that the experience is what Vice is used to providing as an experience? Is that fair? Yeah, essentially, yeah. How do you hold them accountable? I don't know if I quite understand the accountability question, but if we are programming that block, if there's a, you know, a virtual linear block, and if you can break out into on-demand content, I think that it's, the accountability is on us to program well, you know, to understand the different audiences, to think about day parting in a you know, multi-device ecosystem, to uh, think about different ways to curate our contact, uh, content to create a really enjoyable lean back experience and thinking about how you sort of create you know, a sort of meta narrative between different pieces of content that otherwise are just purely on demand. And then if you have the right content available, I think that, that you're in a good place. And I think in terms of accountability, if I can, if I can take a stab at understanding, um, you know, I think that that's just a function of good deal making. Yeah, no, I guess what I'm thinking is more of you putting your content on their application, uh, and you expect, your audience expects a certain kind of experience from what they've had before. Yeah, I mean, so to the question of, just to repeat it, um, that the audience expectation of a, of a consistent experience of the Vice brand. Um, you know, the, the way that we think about digital multi-platform distribution is we do want to ensure that there is some relative parity in the content offering across multiple places because if someone is a fan of a particular show um, and then they go to another platform with the intent to consume that, in the same window, by the way, so ad supported, let's just say, um, there should be a reasonable expectation that that content is available. Uh, and if, as a user, I'm going to different places and I can't find the thing that I'm looking for, but I'm still in the Vice ecosystem, I'm likely not to blame Sling, I'm likely to blame Vice. So I think that, especially as you think about, you know, I mean, any, 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 any media company with a Twitter account is in the customer service business, right? And as you start thinking about things like subscription products, and as you start thinking about multi-device distribution, that's only going to get more and more complicated, right? And so I think that you know, to borrow the lessons of some other industries, the best customer service strategy is to have a really good, well-defined, and consistent product, right? And so if we think about a consistent offering across multiple touch points, I think that you can uh, largely you know, stem whatever negative feedback you may have come back uh, based on, you know, if you start getting into, well, this show is going to go on this thing for just that. And if you don't clearly explain that to the user, um, you know, up front, you're going to have to explain it to them on the back. Other questions for the panel? Anyone? In the back? So let me just repeat that. So the idea is in a world where there's lots of channels, there's obviously big ones like ESPN, there's big ones like ABC and CBS, but there's literally hundreds of smaller networks we could take, whether it be, um, the, you know, uh, think the American Heroes Network, which is part of Discovery, or it's uh, probably you could even say, you know, VH1 still exists on TV. What happens to all of the smaller channels that are out there relative to this huge over-the-top um, creations that many of you are working on. John's not in his head, so why don't you start? They're in a tough position because their uh, cost structure is so out of whack with the cost structure in the over-the-top world, for starters. So they're just spending a ton more money just to keep going, and uh, it, it doesn't bode well for them. If they're lucky, uh, necessity will force them to come up with hits you know, my co-founder, Jeff Gaspin, when he ran VH1, came up with pop-up videos and behind the music and put them front and center. And when he ran Bravo, which was one of those also ran networks at the time, he came up with Queer Eye and Project Runway. So Gr great content at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, at, the, at least relative to the consuming audience for that channel. That's right. And you can get that content in front of audiences in many more ways than you were able to 20 years ago. I want to hear your thoughts. 
<laughs> I was thinking the same. Thing. No, look, I, I, I think that. <laughs> That's why you know, I was nodding at you. No, I mean, look, I, I think the challenge is, is that there, you know, we've lived in this world where the bundle has allowed lots of weaker entities to be pulled along, and consumers have ended up paying for things that they never really wanted or watched, and they never had a choice. That's why I think what Verizon's doing, whether it's contract legal or not, we could certainly sit with a dictionary and read the definition of a tier versus a you know, customizable base package. The court will figure that out. But the idea that there are lots of channels that the consumer doesn't care about. I mean, if you're not a sports fan, do you care about having five RSNs in LA and ESPN and Fox Sports and NBC Sportsnet? The answer is clearly no. Uh, you know, there are so many channels that you are forced to take. And I think there is a perception that, well, it won't be any cheaper if the bundle breaks, that you'll end up spending the same amount of money. I'm not sure that's so bad for the consumer. Even if I don't think it's about saving money. I think it's, if someone mentioned earlier, we all customize our phone screens. We all customize our tablet screens. People like customizing, and I think they like having control over the experience versus being forced that says, here's the menu. You're going to eat what's on this menu, and you have absolutely no choice if you don't like what's on the menu other than not eating at all. I think we're in a world where that's just not acceptable anymore. And especially because there's so much other content away from the experience that all of you are working on or creating, that I think it's going to be very, very challenging for these smaller players. They're going to have to figure out how they either create great content, or I think they're going to cease to exist or at least be far less profitable than they are today. I think that'll probably be the, the ending comment, is that you're going to lose a lot of profitability. Let's turn this around for 30 seconds. In the room, just raise your hand if you are passionately a fan of ESPN. Couldn't live without ESPN. Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. Less than half the room, maybe half the room. Passionate about the Discovery Channel. Passionate about Lifetime. Hmm. No one raised their hand just for everyone who's watching. <laughs> I don't think there's actually a hand up, but you know, passionate about, I don't know, uh, MTV. Bad, it's kind of probably too, young, too old of an audience. On it. Let's take another one. Um, food Network. Couldn't live without Food Network. Less than, well less than a quarter of the room. Like, that's the problem, right? Is that, you know, there's just so much, there, there's so many channels, to your point, that the average person doesn't need what happens in that universe, that, that shakeout that you're basically raising the question. Yeah, and if they fall out, you see yourselves maybe being able to catch those and blossom your own portfolio. Are there subscription dollars available for Vivo or for Vice or for Tap or for Crave is essentially, I think, the question. Well, I think, it, I think the pressure is already, already kind of coming the other way, right? I mean, you've already got, in a way, the the HGTVs and the Food Networks live on YouTube in, in another form, in another name, right? You've got, um, you know, this just plethora of content out there, especially for specialty areas, for niche areas, you know, whether it's cooking or military or, you know, making, right? I mean, there's, there's uh, so I think one of the reasons is to your point, I mean, these are just drag along channels. I mean, forget MTV, what about MTV Hits, MTV Jams, VH1 Classics, you know, the 35 other channels that Viacom jams down the, the MSO's, you know, throats. Um, so on the one hand, you've got from that side the fact that, you know, users are forced to buy these and don't really care, but, but there's pressure from the other way because they're already, you know, thousands of other creators who are out there creating channels and, you know, gaining subscribers and, and, you know, we haven't talked much about YouTube, but I mean, it's become this launching pad for cheap talent. And how many shows have now launched, you know, at least within the well, look, Michelle Fon's got a joint right. venture with Endemol now, and she's creating content well beyond just right. what she does for YouTube. One last question before we go. In the back, he's had his hand up for a while. The white. I was wondering if kind of segue to all the things we've been talking about, but where do you see the old traditional like two million dollars? Obviously, you know, brands slash channels are kind of going to have to market themselves. How do you see that change? 
to, for brands that want to drive immediate reach for their brand or for their message, the live experience, what happens to live in the world that we're talking about? Yeah. What's happening now with that? I think, um, I think, uh, Should the, repeat the, the question? Yeah, the, so, so the question was, um, you know, you, you, there's a show that you like on a, on a particular network and it's followed by something they think you may also be interested in. What, what's going to happen when, you know, all of these, these uh, middle of the pack channels, so to speak, uh, have their one hit show and the others that are filling the time are no longer available? I think, um, Number one, uh, to, to think that linear is driving discovery is an interesting thought. I think uh, you've got uh, fragmented audiences finding content that they, that they love. There are ferocious fans of HBO content and it's switched to instead of watching linear, unless you're trying to get the last Game of Thrones episode before it gets up on BitTorrent or you can't wait that long, we're not sure. <laughs> Um, you're going to watch it on demand and you're going to watch it when it's most convenient for, for you. Outside of major events like the Super Bowl or the Oscars, um, driving tune-in I think is, is while important for media companies that have broadcast networks, uh, consumers are less and less uh, consuming content that way. So content discovery happens on YouTube or you may also like or with how how the great, great content will move from middle of the pack and you'll have less networks with better content and by extension, uh, bigger on-demand uh, libraries. But that's going to force brands to figure out new ways to reach consumers, which is exactly what companies like Vice and Tap and Vivo are working on is new branded experiences that go well beyond the 30-second spots that, to the gentleman's question, are just not being watched anymore. That's why we build channels around personalities who have rabid fan bases who are f hanging on their every word on social media. So all Sarah Palin has to do is say, hey, I have a channel now. You should go check it out. And whoosh, there they go. And with that, I want to thank our panelists. We're out of time, but I really appreciate everyone coming and listening. Thank you.